Hey, co-occurring class, this is our lecture for what week are we in? Week two, covering chapters two, three, and four of our textbook, which really looks at the comprehensive assessment. So this lecture might be a little bit longer than normal. As always, remember that um, if you are, you know, if uh, it's helpful down at the bottom of your screen, uh, where the bar that shows how much time there's left on the lecture. On the right hand side, there should be a little button that says speed and you can speed this up. So um, you can also search the transcript if that's helpful for you, um, especially as you're using, if you're using this as a resource, um, I'm kind of coming back to it. Like, oh, I know Katie talked about that. I'm gonna search this term, I'm gonna search this term and I bet I can jump ahead in the video to where she talked about it instead of having to rewatch the entire thing. So let's jump in. Let's see what our text says about assessments. So assessment, what is the purpose of the assessment? So part of that purpose is engagement, getting to know the client. Um, it is a tremendous amount of data collection. It is really probably the most you'll talk in a non-psychoeducational um, um, setting to collect data. And it's a continuous process throughout treatment. So those of you that are taking 260 and 261, you're gonna be learning that it's assessment and reassessment. We are constantly making sure that our clients are in the correct, getting the correct services that they need. And we're always reassessing that to see if they're benefiting, what we need to change. Um, are they in the right place? Did I say, are they still eligible for this level of care? Is it still appropriate? Do they need more? Do they need less? Um, what's being helpful? What should we add? Is there something that we've resolved, right? Um, so we're always assessing. Um, and it's an opportunity for the type client to tell their story, identify what they might like to change, so their goals, and to really assess for level of motivation. We're also going to, because we're going to tie our interventions to level of motivation. It can be a challenge to differentiate symptoms of substance use or underlying psychiatric disorder. When you get, as you get more familiar with some of the psychiatric disorders in the DSM-5, you're going to notice that most of them have a disclaimer um, that says, you know, cannot be attributable to substance use. Well, if they're using substances, gosh, how hard is it for us to really know? Um, so we have generating a differential. So is the anxiety from an anxiety disorder or is the anxiety seen in various states of withdrawal or could it be old, or could it be both? So, right, is the anxiety happening because of the substance or is an actual anxiety disorder present? And it's really hard to determine that if we don't pull out the substance, right? Could it be both things? Yeah, it could be both things. Um, so are the, um, are the voices someone hears a symptoms of schizophrenia or of alcohol withdrawal? Could they be caused by PCP or synthetic cannabis intoxication? So where, you know, like what is the pathology of this? Where is it coming from? It's really hard to know that during the assessment, but also we gather history to ask those questions. So we're gathering history and say, you know, is a time that this was more present? Is the time when this was less present? And we're building a timeline so we can see kind of parallel what did their mental health symptoms look like? What was going on with their substance use? Are we seeing patterns here? We, can, we weigh all information and use it to clarify diagnosis, map out goals, not bowls, map out goals and objectives and refine and assess treatment. So we're gathering this information. We'll always make a referral to a mental health um, person as appropriate because we wanna make sure that we are working within our scope of practice as an LAC. Um, but we can gather this information. We can provide information to the client. So bro, chapter two, 
Um, so we look at the first part of the comprehensive assessment. So we're looking at um, personal history, psychiatric, family and social histories, and the mental health or the, and the mental status examination. Often as LACs, we won't be doing a mental status evaluation, um, like an actual like um, formalized one, but it, we do, I do want you to be familiar with them, what they look like, because you'll be reading them and what they, you know, what they mean. So personal identifying information, we're looking at age, race, marital status, um, other important identifying information. So we're provide, providing just a basic demographic, um, just really basic demographics. Client is a 26 year old Caucasian female, divorced with two children. She's living with her parents and unemployed. That's helpful to know at the onset of the assessment, right? Age makes a difference. Um, gender makes a difference. Race makes a difference. Marital status makes a difference. Parental status makes a difference, right? So looking at how is she feeling about living with her parents and being unemployed? How does that impact her substance use, right? So looking at all of those things. Um, so that's helpful at the onset to start with those demographics. Then we have the chief complaint or presenting problem. So that is, the chief complaint is really the client's stated reason for seeking the assessment. It might be, um, it's always helpful, I think, to use client language when appropriate. So I want to get clean. I think in all of my courses, if you've taken other classes from me, you would, you would say, Katie, you say you can't use that language. It's not person first language, or it's not, it's stigmatizing language, right? Um, it is stigmatizing language. I wouldn't use, I never in my words would say this client, um, the client's here because they want to be clean. That wouldn't be the language that I would use as I was describing them. But if that's, it's their stated reason. So it's their stated reason. I think that it can be helpful to incorporate that. That's also the language that your client is using. And um, it's also interesting to explore that with them. Is that an empowering term for them or does it actually, in, does it actually contribute to internalized stigma that makes seeking help challenging for them? Um, my anxiety is through the roof, right? Like that might be a stated reason. So it can be in client's own words, but it's okay and sometimes appropriate to replace that with clinical language. So you might also see um, achieve abstinence is a chief complaint. And you might see that in a treatment plan as one of the goals. Um, or disability, anxiety, and agoraphobia. So you might see that as the client stated reason for seeking the assessment. We also want to know the history of the presenting problem. Earlier, I talked about building that timeline, right? It's always helpful to see what's been going on in the person's life, how their mental health, how their substance use has all kind of interweaved throughout that. So this is a client's narrative and the clinician gets a sense of the client's perspective. Um, we get to understand also how clients respond to crises. Often clients seek help in response to a crisis or an acute challenge. So the presenting problem um, the history of the presenting problem might also leave us with the chief complaint. And it's important to gain an understanding of the current challenge, but also a clear history. When we start talking about treatment, we can look at, oh, this same thing has happened before. How did they navigate it before? Were those efforts successful? Were they unsuccessful? Should we be pulling from some of those previous coping strategies? Or maybe they were maladaptive and we need to work at addressing those. Psychiatric history, again, as an LAC, this is beyond our scope of practice to diagnose and treat, but we can still ask these questions and gather this information, which will be helpful for the client if we refer them to somebody that is that can treat their psychiatric disorder. So it's crucial for understanding the client. It's also helpful to have various sources of information here. So we're always using client report but we can also use past records or other collateral information like talking to another provider 
or a family member to gain an understanding, especially if the client is an unreliable reporter for whatever reason. Um, it could be, you know, fear of being honest in the assessment. It could be that they aren't a reliable reporter because, you know, their substance use has impacted their memory or their, you know, or their psychiatric status has impacted that as well. Or maybe there's a cognitive or an intellectual disability there that makes that challenging. We want to know past treatments and when we're doing past treatments, we want to know what was helpful, what wasn't helpful. We want to know about the onset of the treatments, um, mood, thoughts, or onset of symptoms. And what are those symptoms? Are they moods, thoughts, behaviors? When did they start? And do they ever notice them coming and going? We want to know client treatment preferences. Yeah, I've tried this before and I don't want to do it again, or I'm really reluctant to do that. You know, my yeah, my doctor said that I should look at an antidepressant, but I don't want to do that. Okay. You know, like, that's great. We can, you know, there are other ways to treat depression and we can provide psychoeducation. And if medication seems appropriate, we can always provide psychoeducation about that. Past medication trials and attempts at treatment, were they helpful? And a thorough, a thorough examination of psychiatric history um, is helpful to achieve an accurate diagnosis. Psychiatric diagnoses are tough. And so the more data we can gather, the um, more likely it is that we can achieve an accurate diagnosis. We, we can look at psychiatric advanced directives. So these are clients' preferences for treatment. So these include, um, we look at symptoms and diagnosis and client experiences during a crisis. So during a crisis, what happens in your life? right? What's going on? And if that crisis happens, who do we contact or not contact? We also need to provide informed consent. You know what? If a crisis happens, it's our responsibility as mandated reporters to help keep you safe. So if that happens, this, is, this will be my response. There, a designated person to make healthcare decisions should be, um, should client be unable. So if you are unable to make healthcare decisions for yourself due to your, um, due to your psychiatric state or health, who should we, you know, like who should step in and do that? What are your preferred medications? What has helped in the past? What are your preferred facilities? I don't like going here, but I've had really good support at Providence with Dr. Z. Um, and what's helped in the past? What are proven strategies to help client regain, can, regain that emotional and behavioral control? Often in a crisis, it's really hard to access the planning part of our brain to say, oh, I'm in crisis. You know what's worked in the past is this. Clients have to be pretty advanced in their abilities to be able to do that. So especially in early stages of treatment, we need to write this out. It needs to be like physically there for this client and they need to know, oh, if this is happening, I wrote this down. I'm going to pull this up. It's on my refrigerator, right? Somewhere where they can find it. We need to know about family psychiatric history. So many psychiatric disorders have a genetic component. It's really important for that. Um, and pages 23 through 26 of edition one of your text um, provide a sample handout for gathering the psychiatric and family psychiatric history. So we don't have to make this up on our own. We don't have to know all the questions to ask us, but we have resources from our textbook, from SAMHSA, um, from NADAC, all of these places that can help inform our assessment. What are some of the, what are some of the data that we should gather that's going to be helpful in assessing and treating this client? Social history. So a social history is a personal history that it provides important clues to the current situation, client aspirations, and their challenges. So when gathering this information, us as the LAC, we often gain information that's helpful in determining onsets of symptoms, if there was an event that triggered those, sim those symptoms, and really, again, gaining insight into that causality between What's happening in my life, my socially, what's happening with my psychiatric health and my substance use, right? Um, a family and cultural attitudes, it's, it's helpful to notice that. Everyone, 
my family drinks and uses drugs. I thought it was normal, you know, um, as soon as, you know, like I was drinking with my dad at like 12, because that's, that's just what we did. Um, so again, there's a client handout and how to gather this information more on page 28 of the first edition of the text. My second edition is being delivered um, during the first week of class. So I should be able to incorporate, I know we're working out of both texts this semester. Um, so I will update, I will do my best to get this information updated for future lectures. Trauma history. We want to gain an understanding of a person's experience. So we're looking at victimization. So if they ever experienced or been the victims of a traumatic event, we're looking at abuse, assault, violence, ACEs scores, ACEs. So we can give ACEs screenings. Um, when we're looking at trauma history, we don't, it's not best practice to just like hand them the ACEs screening sheet, right? This is something that we can do verbally. It's something that is always helpful during the assessment, but if we're not having that rapport with that client, if it's been tough to build and maybe because they're really guarded because of their history, um, that makes sense. So we can, like I said, at the beginning of this lecture, we're always assessing. So we can bring this information back in, you know, we can bring this back in. Um, we're looking at current or ongoing trauma. So things like bullying, harassment, racism, homophobia, living in a violent neighborhood, you know, what are those outside stressors that are continuing to re-trigger that trauma that the client lives with every day or almost every day? A great question to ask for this is what are the three most impactful moments in your life? And clients will often share with you, clients sometimes think about trauma as just, you know, like abuse, right? Um, and it's not always just abuse. Trauma, trauma looks, it, really trauma is subjective and it depends on how we experience it. So we can frame it in those three most impactful moments in your life. And we're going to hear about how um, you know what? My dad yelled at me a lot when I was little and, um, that was really hard for me. Yeah, that's trauma, right? Like clients don't always attach abuse to that because it can be really hard to label yourself as a person who's been abused or to label your father who you love as an abuser, but it still had this trauma impact on me. So we can frame it in that way because sometimes people with, do have trauma, but they don't really identify it as trauma. So there are some great trauma screening questions provided in your textbook. Legal history. So we want to know about it. So substance use disorders and some mental health disorders are associated with higher rates of arrests and legal problems. Um, felony records prohibit full participation in society. So we need to know their legal history. If their goal, if one of their goals is to go back to school and they're expecting to get financial aid to do that, but they have a felony on their record, can they do that? Um, or what are some of those processes that need to be in place in order to help them with that, right? So there's a place that, that's where legal history could, you know, like they, how about housing, right? I have a felony on my record, so I can't find housing or I can't find work. Um, collateral information can be helpful in gaining an accurate legal history. Do they have a probation officer? Do they have a lawyer you can talk to? Um, we really want to practice non-judgment. Here's the thing. The substance use disorders and mental health disorders are highly criminalized. You know, we, we punish people when they are... We punish people. It's it's what we do as a society. We've criminalized this, and um, yeah, I think there's a whole soapbox issue. There's a whole soapbox here, but for the purpose of this chapter, it's we really need to practice non-judgment. We really, and I think that that also will come with experience when we recognize that, like, wow, I'm working. Most of the people that I'm working with have a legal history. Um, I can think of, you know, like it's a very small percentage of 
people who have substance use disorders that um, don't have some type of legal uh, legal history or current presenting legal challenges. Um, so there's some great questions for gathering that legal history in your text. So a mental status examination. So again, for this one, we're not always, as an LEC as part of our assessments, we're generally not getting a, doing a mental status examination, but we do need to know how to read them, um, how to interpret them, why they're important. Um, so we, so a mental status examination is a systemic review of a person's thought processes, observ observable behaviors and emotional state. And it really is, it's a point in time. So the whole assessment as a whole, so the assessment as a whole, and I really should have started with this, the assessment as, as a whole is at a point in time. So this is what this client looked like on January 3rd at one o'clock in the afternoon. Like this is what was going on in that client's life. And the assessment probably is gonna look really different on February 3rd. And that's part of the reason we are always doing assessment is at least in the back of our minds, we're thinking about, okay, when I first started working with this client on January 3rd, this was true, but all of these things have changed. And the same thing is true for the mental status examination. It captures a picture of a client at a point in time, if at the point in time that we actually did or that mental status examination was completed. It might not be reflective of them 100% of the time. And in fact, it probably isn't. If we were to do them about ourselves, we probably would, you know, we would see that there are pieces of it that go up and down. You know, we, we look at, um, you know, like how a person is dressed. Well, guess what? There are some days when um, my life is so chaotic that um, I'm dressed a lot differently, you know, like um, some days, you know, my hair is done, my makeup is done. And some days it's none of that is done. It's ponytail um, and leggings. And this is, this is what I get. So it's always going to, it's going to shift and change if there are big dramatic shifts or really like challenging things that they're dealing with that are constant. Like those are the things that we really are looking for. So we are looking for abnormal findings. We want to note and explore those, um, observe and record areas of strength and struggle. We want to keep an open mind and avoid jumping to conclusions. So for example, findings can be indicative of a multitude of issues. Maybe this person looks really disheveled because they're experiencing withdrawal symptoms. That would do it. Um, maybe their thought processes are abnormal because they're going through withdrawal. Yep, that makes sense. Um, or because they're intoxicated. Yep, sure, of course. Um, maybe they're experiencing some anxiety related to the assessment. Makes sense. Um, maybe there's a cognitive disorder. Yep, that would do it, right? So we don't want to jump to conclusions, but we do want to observe, right? Um, so pages 31 to 34 discuss the elements of this. Again, this isn't something that as an LAC generally that we do, but we should be familiar with them. We want to assess for dangerousness. So we are looking at suicidality and homicidality. And, um, you know, as we know, a person's current or future behavior is highly influenced by past behavior. So we wanna thoroughly assess a person's current and past thoughts of suicide and or homicide. And not just thoughts of it, but we also wanna know about, um, we wanna know about past thoughts, current thoughts, but we also want to know about attempts. Um, we're doing this to determine imminent risk. So we also want to look at risk and protective factors. So there are some static risk factors. A static risk factor is something that cannot be changed. So past behavior, again, predictive of future behavior. Um, if somebody has a past suicide attempt, we, that's static. We can't change that. A mental disorder, family history, gender, age, race, all of those things cannot be changed. We know that um, old, that aging Caucasian men are at the highest risk for 
um, completing suicide. That is something that I can't reverse time. You know, I can't change my race. Like those things are static. Um, there are dynamic risk factors, and those are things that can be changed and that we can work on addressing. So access to lethal means. Oh, you're saying that you're having thoughts of suicide and that your plan includes taking the pill, taking the benzodiazepines and the alcohol that are in your house. Okay, who can we get to help you get those out of your house? Are you willing to do that? Um, treatable mental health symptoms, substance use, legal issues, recent losses, how to cope with things like financial losses, death, um, relationship stress. So how do we cope with those things in a way that feels manageable? Can we build distress tolerance skills? Can we, um, what are some of the options that we can do to reduce that threat of imminent risk? We also want to assess protective factors. So some protective factors are things like faith, religion, spirituality, family ties and responsibility, fear of the outcome of acting on urges. So often when I ask people, well, what's kept you from that? You know what? I live with my mom and I know that she would find me and I just can't do that to her. Okay. Um, so living with her mom is really helpful for this right now. And like self-efficacy, my belief that I can get through this challenge. Like, you know what? Yeah. I, I know that this is only temporary. I have felt this way before. And sometimes as the LAC, we can point that out. Like, man, you know, like I know that because I got this really good social history, if someone is currently expressing suicide, suicidal ideation as the LAC, I could say, you know, I remember when we did your assessment and you shared with me after this happened, that these were the things that were helpful. You know, you've, you've navigated the storm before and helping them realize, yeah, this is temporary. Strengths. We always want to include strengths in an assessment. We always want to include strengths throughout our treatment, throughout all of every stage of treatment. Um, but it's important to do an ongoing assessment of strength throughout treatment. Uh, this validates, this helps to validate the client when they're struggling. And self-identified strength help clinicians know how the client views themselves and who they want to be. So often, you know, we talked earlier that often crisis brings a client into an assessment. And generally, it's it can be really hard for clients to answer this question. Like they could talk about trauma, they could talk about this thing, but when you ask them to say something kind about themselves or identify something that they do well in their lives, Sometimes they need help with this. And so what I would say about that is when you're documenting it and somebody has to struggle with it, document that they're struggling with it. Again, seeing progress through treatment, clients are probably going to start being able to see their strengths and being able to, to say as their LAC, do you remember when we first started working together and during your assessment, you were asked about strengths and you said, I don't have any, or I can't think of any. And you got really tearful, man, you just listed off three things to me that were strengths of yours. You said this, you said this, you said this, you know, how cool is that? What do you think has changed? Right? Like explore that with them because it's likely those strengths have been present all along, but you just couldn't see them maybe back at the assessment. Um, strengths can be a source of motivation throughout treatment. Okay, let's jump into chapter three. So we're continuing to look at the assessment here. So we're looking at, we're going to cover substance use, medical history, and collateral. So again, so challenges for accurate diagnosing. Diagnosing is hard. Um, there's a, there can be a misunderstood pathology of the symptoms. So what is the onset of the symptoms? Where did they come from? Well, I don't really have a clear understanding, which makes it really hard to find the diagnosis. Um, substance use, right? It's really hard to find a diagnosis when substance use is present, whether that's uh, current intoxication, withdrawal, or long-term effects. Stigma can be challenging. Man, you know, it can be challenging for the client. It can be challenging for the clinician. I don't want to diagnose this person with borderline personality disorder because 
this is all results of their trauma, right? Um, minimization and denial. So maybe we're getting, we're not getting a clear and accurate representation of how the, of how their life has, a client's life has been impacted by them because they're not, they're minimizing that impact or they're, they're experiencing denial, which is really normal. Also cultural and religious attitudes can make that helpful. And the text I think is really referring to, um, co-occurring or, um, like mental health diagnoses here, but substance use, it can be really hard to assess the severity of a, of a substance use disorder when some of these things are present as well. Um, that minimization stigma, um, even getting a clear understanding of what the substance use looks like when it started, how much, how often, things like that. And so what we want to do is we really want to look for objective data. So objective data are things like, what are your symptoms? Um, and again, those can be subjective to a degree, but a symptom is a symptom. Maybe they're not giving us all of them, um, but they are what the client is experiencing. Genetics, environment, epigenetics, experience, culture, age, gender, beliefs, spirituality, goals, aspirations. We are including those all throughout our, all throughout our assessment. So substance use is free. What do we want to know when we are gathering this information? We want to know when for every, for every single substance. So I want to know for alcohol, for tobacco, for marijuana, for um, heroin, you know, what, and also opiates in general. What did your opiate use, you know, like, what did that look like? So for every single substance, I want to document this separately. So I want to know the age of first use. I want to know how use has progressed over time. Think about those things. What's happening in my life? What's happening with my mental health? What's happening with my substance use? It's going up and down. I'm changing substances. Um, when did the client first identify use as problematic? Maybe they don't view it as problematic. It's not my problem. It's my wife's problem. And that's the reason that I'm here today, right? It's not my problem. Um, I don't have a problem. I um, just had bad luck and I got caught with my third DUI, right? Um, okay. That's really helpful to know, right? We talked earlier about motivation and client strengths and how they really view their substance use is really helpful for us to know when we are working with clients. We want to know how much is used. Um, we want to know what the primary goal of substance use is. So is it to get high? Because it feels good. Is it to alleviate emotional or behavioral symptoms? Is it to be social? You know what? Um, I had a really hard time hanging out with groups of people in high school. And I noticed after I had a couple of beers that it was easier for me to do that. And then my alcohol use has continued to increase. Um, so then also now that I'm not drinking, how do I go and be social with people? Hmm. Um, so you've got some assessment tools provided in your textbook. So every, um, every substance use disorder, we gather all of that information separately for every substance. And somebody gets a diagnosis if they meet criteria for every substance. So somebody might have alcohol use disorder, moderate, and cannabis use disorder, severe, and um, anxiolytic use disorder, mild, right? So somebody might have, there's a diagnosis, it's not just substance use disorder, mild, moderate, severe. We need to know every substance has its own, has its own diagnosis. So they all have the same criteria. So we need to know for every substance, what impaired control looks like, what social impairment looks like, risky use of substance and pharmacological criteria. So we are looking at all of those. And for every, for all of those, if somebody has two to three boxes of that checked, then they would have moderate or mild alcohol use disorder, mild. If somebody, if we checked four to six of those boxes, then it would be moderate. Um, opioid use disorder, moderate. 
If somebody had six or more of those, we would be looking at amphetamine use disorder, um, amphetamine use disorder, methamphetamine type, severe, right? Six or more of those. So that is what we're looking at. Um, so those are the criteria for all of those, for all of the diagnoses for substance use disorder. So family substance use history, why is this important to get? Well, there can be a really strong genetic component to substance use. Um, there's also belief, so it's, there's a, it's a bit of, what do we call it? Nature and nurture, right? There's a nature piece to it where, boy, genetically I'm predisposed to substance use, to substance use challenges based on my genetics. And it's just something I inherited. Just like, you know, if I have a strong family history of um, breast cancer, then I'm at higher risk for breast cancer. Um, beliefs and norms about substance use. So nature and nurture. Well, you know, like all of the messages that I've received over my lifetime from my family have been that it's really normal to smoke weed every night before I go to bed or to have a few drinks before I go out or to, um, you know, whatever it is, it's not a big deal. Alcohol is not a big deal. You know, um, that also makes it really hard to stop, right? I'm going to a family function and my family isn't going to understand why I'm not drinking. So who in their life has had issues? Um, has anybody stopped using? Who's currently using? Are those people currently in the house? Um, so yeah, substance use history, medical history. So there's often a relationship with medical issues and co-occurring disorder. So one example is that injuries can lead to abuse of pain medications. Um, so we want to assess that. We want to know if they've ever abused their prescribed medications before. Also, recurrent illnesses and surgeries can lead to things like PTSD or recurrent depression. That shouldn't be a question mark. <laughs> Um, so there's some screening questions for medical history there. That's also when we pull in like ASAM criteria, that's all dimension two stuff that's really helpful. Pain assessment. So we want to know, um, we want to assess and address. So when we're assessing it, we're looking at location. Where's your pain? The quality of the pain. Describe it to me. Is it stabbing? Is it crushing? Is it pins and needles? And the duration, is it constant? Does it come and go? Are there things that you know that impact it coming and going? Circum okay, that was circumstances related to the pain. So what alleviates the pain? What worsens the pain? And what's your severity on a scale of one to 10? You can even have, you know, like you go to the doctor's office and they have those faces, you know, on one to 10. You can even give that to them. Um, we want to know how does a client manage their pain? Can they manage their pain sober? And are they under medical care for their pain? So, um, sometimes people use because of their pain. And so the thought of not drinking alcohol is going to lead to anxiety about my back pain is going to come back and now I'm not going to sleep. So I'm not sleeping. My back hurts and I'm not drinking. I can't not drink right? So guess what? Are they under medical care for this? Can we work collaboratively with a primary care provider to help manage their pain without um, medications that have the potential for abuse um, so that they, so that the client can reach their goals of living a pain-free life or they can manage their pain appropriately and also achieve their goals related to stopping or lowering their substance use. Family and other sources of information. So collateral, collateral can be helpful when we are, so we wanna do a couple of things. The thing that's missing from this slide is informed consent. So we want clients to sign, well, we are required to have clients sign a release of information. But we also wanna to talk to them about that. When am I going to reach out to collateral information? What information am I gonna be asking for? How is that information going to be used? And what are the client's thoughts about that? Are they excited that I'm gonna call their family member or are they having some nervousness about it? What's why, you know, like what's going on there? So things we might 
Um, some common places we might be getting some collateral information, family, probation officer, um, healthcare providers, caseworkers, maybe um, previous treatment or concurrent treatment. So maybe they do have a mental health provider that has referred them over to us. So we wanna get um, records to those people who are treating them maybe in the past, but also currently. Also, we want future people. So like if um, we know that maybe I'm working in an inpatient unit and I know that it's I'm going to be referring them out to this program when I'm done, I'm gonna need a release of information in place to do that. So prior records. We want to gather records that will be helpful for us. So things like past or current substance use or, med or mental health treatment, medical treatment, or the or prescription monitoring, the PDR. So the PDR is the pharmacy drug registry. And in Montana, um, doctors have access to this. So when they get somebody that's presenting in their office with pain and they're like, oh, I don't know about this person, they can pull up the prescription drug registry and they can say, whoa, Katie Smith has seen this doctor, this doctor, and this doctor and has prescription opiates from all of them. Like I need to contact these doctors and we need to get this person maybe over to the pain clinic so that we can better address this person's pain because this person um, is at high risk for you know, this person is at high risk for overdose and death. Like I have an obligation here. Why is this helpful? Um, so I talked about this earlier about collateral information. So sometimes people aren't really, sometimes people have challenges even remembering and being reliable reporters. Maybe they have cognitive and memory challenges related to cognitive challenges, uh, substance use, their mental health. Stigma, you know, self-stigma is, a, is um, problematic. It really, stigma is a big deal. Stigma that we internalize, stigma from outside sources. Think about, um, you know, how hard it would be for a pregnant woman to come into your office and say, yes, I'm using every day um, and I'm pregnant. And that's hard. That is a hard thing to admit. And to me, it makes sense when clients minimize or um, especially in the beginning of a therapeutic relationship, like I don't know how this person is going to react and everybody else has judged me for it. And I feel so much shame about it that I can't be honest about it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and denial, you know, denial is a, an automatic process. And the pervasive thing about denial is that we don't often know that we're in denial until we start doing some work. So, um, so yeah, those are reasons why gathering this outside information can be helpful. They can just provide a clearer picture of what's going on for the client. All right, the last part of the comprehensive assessment, we're gonna look at stages of change and level of motivation for change. So chapter four is a pretty quick chapter. Uh, so we have the stage of change theory. This is assessing readiness for change. And so we have these, um, these stages of change. And note that people don't necessarily always go through these one and one. People can enter and um, go back and forth. So somebody can be in pre-contemplation, get to contemplation and go back to pre-contemplation. People can also be in different stages of the... They can be in different stages of change for different challenges they face. So I'm in pre-contemplation about my alcohol use, but I'm in preparation about my depression. Um, so pre-contemplation, I'm completely unaware that the problem exists. Like, yeah, so what? I drink every day. Like, it's not a problem. I go to work. I pay my bills. Nobody's mad at me. Um, it's fine. Contemplation is... Yeah, I'm aware that there's a problem, but I'm not ready to make a change yet. Like, yeah, I mean, like, sure. Like some days I wake up feeling really hungover and my lab work just came back from my doctor and um, it's showing my liver enzymes are bad, but that could be related to anything. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm not quite sure what change would look like, right? 
and preparation and planning and planning to do something about the problem, but I haven't done anything yet. Like, yeah, I should stop drinking and I'm going to go ahead and do that after the first of the year. Um, action is a decision to, to address the problem. Um, so I'm deciding that I'm going to do something. So you know what? It's January 1st and I told myself I'd stop drinking. I'm going to stop drinking. And maintenance. So the problem has been addressed or I, they use fixed. And I think because we go through these, I, I don't know that fix, fixed is such an absolute term. And I don't know that um, any of these disorders are ever fixed. I think that people learn how to address them. Um, and now efforts are in place to maintain the change. So I stopped drinking on January 1st. I encountered all these challenges. I know how to address that. And um, I've been able to maintain this for a period of time now. Um, relapse, recycle. Um, so I, again, substitute the word recurrence to be less stigmatizing. Recurrence requires a return to an earlier stage to get things back on track. So I'm experiencing a recurrence of symptoms. My depression is worse than it's been. I've started drinking again. Um, so now where am I at in that? I'm, maybe I'm back to preparation and planning because it's like, okay, yep, I'm aware that this is a dress, that this is an issue. What, do I, what am I going to do about it? And termination, the problem no longer requires effort to maintain the change. Um, I've, I'm in long-term... Um, long-term, what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, remission, you know, I'm in long-term remission and um, so I'm feeling like there's termination there. How do we assess motivation for change? So we wanna look at intrinsic versus extrin extrinsic motivators. So extrin extrinsic motivators are things that are outside of the person. Um, and intrinsic are things that are internal. So extrinsic, extrinsic motivation, I just want to point out that there's nothing wrong with somebody who shows up to an assessment and all they can identify is, are external motivators. I'm here because my probation officer, that's it. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Okay. You know what? Guess what? That person's in your office. There are so many people whose POs require them to go and they end up in jail instead of in your office. Um, so extrinsic motivators, I remember having a client uh, sitting in my office and I was asking them about motivation and like they were just exasperated when they said, you know what? Yeah, I only have external motivation. And it was really, it was really eye-opening to me because it was so devastating to this person that they didn't have any internalized motivation. And I always describe it as a place to start, you know, like sometimes it's the DUI that happens that gets that person sober. Sometimes it's losing somebody's family that helps the person recognize that there's a need for change. So sometimes those external motivators are actually really powerful in treatment. Um, so they're also, and, and they're really helpful to identify, um, especially if they're short lived, because if somebody's like, well, I, once I'm off probation, I'm gonna drink again. Wow, that tells us a lot about their motivation to change and um, some things that maybe we should focus on. So, okay, you're gonna drink again. Do you feel confident that you can do that safely? What, how would you know that your drinking was getting out of control? Like what would be present in your life? And starting to like bring those things up for the client to help them gain some awareness of, oh yeah, you know what? I remember, um, I remember when, um, I remember talking to Katie about this in treatment and that like when I stop talking to my friends, that that was, and I'm not talking to my friends anymore, that that was a sign that maybe I'm drinking too much. And oh man, so we can help bring those things. We can plant seeds and we can help bring those things into a client's uh, or, or patient's awareness. So when motivation is high, a person is more likely to change. So if we're assessing motivation and they're like, yep, yeah, 
this is this, 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 this. These are all of my reasons. Awesome. Can we like capitalize on that and really jump into making some important, helping the client make some changes in their life? So in a perfect world, an immediate link to services happens when motivation is high. In reality, I think that we all know that things that we do not have enough services to treat the need. Um, so there are often waiting lists. There are often people have needs for higher levels of care and they don't exist in this um, and they don't exist or they're really hard to access or the client doesn't have, has other barriers such as transportation, health insurance, all these other things. So the, if we can help remove barriers and get people linked to services as soon as possible when that, when we, that motivation is high, um, the outcomes are going to be better. Thank you for watching this lecture. It's a lengthy one. Um, so yeah, give yourself a pat on the back. And as always, if you have questions about content or anything, please head over to that homepage. And um, yeah, all right.